and finally retire. Don't let the devil tell you that God can't use you or that you don't make a difference. You see, at one time or another, we all need someone to minister to us in some way. Are you hearing me? We have an obligation to one another when we get together. We are joint members of the body of Christ. Are you hearing me? And as part of the church, we are to have mutual care for one another. Somebody came up with a statement. I wish I had come up with it, but somebody way younger before me came up with it. People do not care how much about you know until they know how much you care. Some of the sweetest words you'll ever hear is when somebody says, I love you, I'm concerned about you, I care about you. Listen to what the Bible says. First Peter 12, first Corinthians 12, 25. There should be no division in the body, but its parts should have equal concern for each other. In the Bible, then, it actually outlines some things that we are to do for one another. But let me share some scriptures with you about how people in the first century actually did that. They did this. And let me encourage you you will never exhaust the Bible, so don't worry. You can pick it up. You can read it every day. You'll never exhaust it. Every time you pick up something, there's a potential that you'll learn something or see something in a little different light than the way you previously seen it. But I would encourage you to do some reading about what the early church did when they ascended. It's very informative. Let me, let me give you some scriptural thoughts here. In the early church, they ministered to one another. Uh, Philemon 1 7, for we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. You have given a need of real refreshing. 1 Thessalonians 5 11, therefore encourage one another, build each other up just as in fact you are doing. In these scriptures that I'm fixing to read to you, you'll find that some of the notable characters of the Old New Testament church, including Paul, needed, needed ministry from time to time. I made reference to Paul and Silas a moment ago, Acts 16, 14. And they went out of the prison, entered into the house of Lydia, and when they had seen the brother, they comforted them, and they departed. On another occasion, Paul talks about someone who came to visit him when he was in prison. He said, the Lord gave mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my shame. 2 Timothy 1.16. Listen to what Paul says about the Corinthian church in Titus. 2 Corinthians 7.13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and in seeking the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. Let me ask you this. Have you ever come to church and it's, it's like it took the last bit of determination or willpower that you had to get there? It was like there was a resistance, some invisible force that was unrelenting. But you you determined, I'm going to go to the house of God. I'm going to get among the people of God. And lo and behold, during the service, the Lord just blessed you, refreshed you. Something was said or done. And when you left, you were just a different person. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Amen. Church is for you. Uh, the local church, listen to what Paul, when he writes back to the church at Thessalonica, he and Silas and Timothy had gone there and evangelized and established this church, but listen to what he says. First uh, Thessalonians 2.10 Your witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as the Father does his children. Remember those, remember those reciprocals. And I paced those out to you uh, months ago, a few years ago, and uh, we've got some of those copies laying around here. We may need to put some more back out because these are things that we are commanded to do when we get together. Pray one for another, value one another's burdens, comfort one another, encourage one another, edify one another. Those are all things that we're supposed to do when we get together. You may come here 
that in Bina and Beatdown, that when you leave here, you should leave here feeling that you've been strengthened, undergirded, fortified. Hallelujah. Did you know that every Christian at one time or another needs ministry from other believers? Why? I'm going to just tell you why without explanation, okay? This is being recorded, so you can get access to that later. First of all, because of the tempter, the devil and his teammates. The territory, the place where we live, the world, this world system which is evil, the tenants, the people of this world system, and this culture, the Bible says they hate us, the tendency of the flesh. The times in which we live. I read a scripture about that earlier. The tribulation, the, the adversity that we experience. The trials of faith. But now let me switch gears here because I'm giving you this very impressive long sermon title. Knowing the scriptures, following the science. I, I've given you some scriptural things to think about. To let you know that God designed church for you. That when you go to church, when you are in church, when you're part of it, you can expect, you can anticipate receiving something. We have an opportunity and a responsibility to minister one another. And also we have the privilege of them ministering to us. Amen. And let me just remind you, Hebrews 6.10, God takes note of what we do. The, the writer of Hebrews says, God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love and that, you, that you've ministered toward his name, or which you've ministered toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and you do minister. Do you understand that the medical world, the world of medical science, is really caught up now in all things religion, all things religious. One of the big things that they have been into for the last several years is prayer and how prayer works, how prayer brings radical change in people physically. I mean, it is just one of those things, so much so that they're actually being taught this now in medical school. Of course, now they've, they've already accepted the fact that prayer works. Well, we could have told them that, couldn't we? Mm -hmm. So now they're trying to figure out, okay, how does it work? How, how many of you know that they'll never figure that out? Now, let me, let me just remind you of the scriptures that I quoted to you, that the Bible says God wants everybody to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so I've given some truth to you rather hurriedly about church, about a church service, about what is to happen, what can happen in a church service. That we're to care for one another. We're to pray for one another. We're to minister to one another. And we have seen that biblical characters in the first century, they did that when they got together. Sometimes they gave, sometimes they received. And let me also remind you that I quoted scriptures. I didn't elaborate a whole lot. But scriptures, most every one of those was something that would help people emotionally, mentally, physically, but also spiritually. Are you here? You know, sometimes you don't have physical pain, but you've got a deeper pain. Now let me let me just, if you open your bulletin, if you've got a bulletin, would you just open it? And if the very first thing you're going to see up at the top, after you have the name of the church and my name and the date and the phone number, it says, let all things be done for edification. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. That scripture says, that everything that we do while we're here, it is to be done for the upbuilding, for the advancement, for the good. Everything we do here. That is so important. 
Because you know that the devil tries to tear us down, to undermine our faith. And remember 1 Corinthians 14, 31. For you may all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be comforted. Prophesy, he who prophesies, speaks of them in edification, exhortation, and comfort. He who prophesies edifies the church, builds the church up. Church is good for you. So now, guess what? The medical world has discovered that. It is amazing. It is amazing. Just in the brief research that I've done on that one little aspect, I'm working on a major pro project. And so this is kind of one little part of it. But in further investigation for this message today, I like to be current up to date. How many of you heard of Harvard University? Okay, they, they've done study. Maybe you've heard of Columbia. Well, you probably, unless you are really informed, I mean, unless you are really smart, you haven't heard about Duke. <laughs> Aha. They see, Duke doesn't just have a basketball team, but they have a medical school there. And <laughs> Duke Hospital is one of six research hospitals in America. Um, so they've been into this. Some of the key people who are into prayer and um, healing are on Stanford connected to Duke. University of Chicago Medical Center. Uh, surely you've heard of Vanderbilt and the Condors. Well, they've had people there who've also done the study. I'm gonna very briefly, I don't wanna bore you, but I want you to hear this because it's important. We're believing the scriptures, we're following the signs. I've already shared some scriptures with you that inform you that church is intended for your good. It's beneficial to you, amen? So now we're gonna, we're gonna follow the signs, okay? And see, here is the thing that just grinds on me. These people that are sitting up in their ivory towers, they're making decisions about us, and they couldn't care less about us. They've got an agenda. I, I, will, I will have to tell you this. Let me just be political for just about a half a second. The governor of our state is a Christian. And so he has, he has made it very clear. He has made it very clear. We don't want people in churches to get sick. We don't want anything to happen to them. But we have nothing to do. We don't want to do anything in, that will in any way infringe on the rights of people go to the house of God, together, together with other believers. We don't have any authority there. That was smart of this man to do that. I just thought you needed to know that. Actually, the previous, not the incumbent, but the just one that just left as the Attorney General of the United States, I have a copy of a letter that he sent to every U.S. Attorney in America. And he said, let me just tell you that we're not in the business of mandating things, putting restrictions on churches and on people's religious rights. So if anything comes up, you are there to protect their constitutional rights and not to deprive them. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah for us to borrow. But you see, here's what is so sad. It's, it's awful anytime someone loses their life regardless of their age. But you see, at a time when people need that connection, we are we're being driven apart. You see, when you're in trouble, you want to know somebody cares for you. You want to know somebody cares for you. And you can't believe what, what it will do for you when you've lost everything in the world. you got one book left it's a beat up New Testament. The clothes you wear to the hospital, every stitch of it belongs to somebody else. But when you know somebody cares, somebody's concerned about you, you cannot believe what that does for you. 
What has been said about this church, what many of you have said, is one of the greatest compliments it, it could ever be paid to a church. It is the most loving church I've ever seen. Do you understand that there are a number of commandments that are given to the body of Christ? And I've mentioned just three or four of those. They're known as the reciprocals. It's, it's what's called mutual ministry, where the saints minister to one another. Do you know the one command that is given the most in the New Testament? The command to love one another. Amen? Amen. And do you know what is at the heart of everybody? If you know any, any Greek word, then you know agape. Or agape. Let me tell you what is at the heart of that word. To regard the welfare of. To wish well to. Doesn't matter. Roy may be at the lowest point that he's ever been as a Christian. Doesn't matter. My love for him is not to fluctuate. There's to be no variation whatsoever. We're to love with the same love that Jesus loved for us. Amen. We are equally concerned about everybody. Do you understand? And I've thought about this often in the past, as you know, because God has blessed people in our church, and we have a lot of people in this church who have a lot of symbolism on their head. They got all those white hairs and such. So we've had a lot of people who ended up in nursing homes or assisted living. And I can tell you that whenever I go to those places, I go there with mixed emotions. And I can tell you that it does something to me when I see those little ladies and those little men and they're in those chairs and they're usually somewhere around the nursing station and they look like they're in a fog, they look like they're in another world. And I get the feeling that nobody comes to see them. They're disconnected from all of their support system. And then they say something like this, can I go with you? You see, that's where we are today. The devil is on the sidelines. And man, he is just thrilled to death. But do you know what? There's something about the Christian church. When it is facing the most unrelenting, the bitterest con competition, conflict, somehow it rebounds. <laughs> and it reboots, maybe. And it excels. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so here these people are, these people in authority, they're making decisions that separate us, that divide us, that try to stop, that try to silence the voice of the church and the message of Jesus Christ. It's inflicted, inflicted great discomfort upon us, put us at a Tremendous disadvantage. But we're going to go on, amen? Amen. When we need each other the most, when we need each other the most, this is where we're being separated. I'll just, just read some things to you about how, and this is not just people who say, well, I believe in God. These are people who are engaged actively in attending the house of the Lord. So the scientific community, there's all kinds of studies been done, and it says, and here's the bottom line, that church is good for you, that it is very beneficial. Let me just read one statement. This, this person, this is the opinion um, piece in the New York Times, but this is kind of a compilation of this person has concluded. One of the most striking scientific discoveries about religion in uh, recent years is that going to church weekly is good for you. Religious attendance, at least religiosity, boosts the immune system, decreases blood pressure. It may add as much as two to three years to your life. Now this person is being very careful there. Social support is no doubt part of the story. 
A study conducted in North Carolina found that frequent churchgoers had larger social networks with more contact with, with and more affection for and more kinds of social support from those people than those who are unchurched. And we know that social support is directly tied to better health. Do you understand that a grave disservice is being done to these grandmas and grandparents who have been put away somewhere in a nursing home and nobody goes to see them, nobody cares for them, and they're just dying a slow, torturous death. Because there's, there's nobody there to love them and care for them. But you see, that's not the way church is supposed to be. And can I just tell you this? And I don't care where this goes and, and who hears this. I didn't just get off the I didn't just get off the boat. Uh, up until not too long ago, I just thought about myself as being a very young person. Well, I am young at heart. But I've learned a few things, and I'm an observer of people. I like to know. And you know what conclusion I have reached? There's a reason. There's a reason why the average church in America, I'm not talking about the Church of God, I'm talking about across the world, the average church in has an attendance of between 80 and 100 people. Do you think about the implications of that? I heard someone say to me just a few days ago, I like to go to a small church. People who love God, people who are true disciples of Jesus Christ know that we're supposed to be involved, an active member of the body of Christ, unless you do not have control of your mental faculties. If you have control of your mental faculties, you may be blind, you may not, you may be hearing impaired, you may be immobile, but there's something you can do in the name of Jesus to advance the kingdom of God. You can write a card or a letter of encouragement to somebody like Alice used to do. You can call somebody on the phone. There are all kinds of things that you can do to be active, to minister to one another. Amen. But you see, people want to be a part. They want to be a part. They want to, somebody in that church knows them. Somebody in that church cares about them. They want to feel they're part of something. And that is biblical. Amen? Now, that's not, that's not to say that you can't do that in a large church, but I served on staff at two pretty good-sized churches. And when I was with Brother Stovall at East Chattanooga, it was at its peak up until that time. And I was at a great disadvantage. I dealt mostly with the new people, so I knew the new people, and he didn't know them. I'd go to the hospital to visit somebody. I had a name, and I had one consolation, actually two, I had their name, and I knew that when I walked into that room, they'd recognize me because I was a member of the staff, and I preached on a regular basis there. I didn't know them. I wanted to. I preached the funeral of someone since I've been here a pastor. There's no way you can know who I'm, going to, who I'm talking about. But I'm very close to this family, have been for years. And after the funeral, the children of this person came to me and they said, we wanted someone to preach our mama's funeral. Who knew our mama? Now that's that's something that's very very simple, but this is that's a part of the life. Amen. Church is supposed to be a family. We're a body, a people. And so one of the things that is eating away, and it would surprise you at the Christians who are depressed and discouraged. Why? Because they don't have that contact. But now I've been trying to encourage you, thank God for the technology we have today because we can do things today that we couldn't do when I was born. Amen? I remember my grandmother got electric lights. I'm not that old, but it just took a while to get lights past her house. <laughs> we, have, we have technology today. So there are incredible things that we can do. We're doing one of those right now. We're taking advantage of one of those right now. But I can tell you this. There is no substitute for personal one-on-one -on -one contact. There is no 
substitute for that. Are you hearing me? And this is why I've been encouraging you to call one another. We have the technology to do that. You can do all kinds of things today. As a matter of fact, that we visited with Mary Lee this week. And she was telling you about how she had communicated with Donna. And so they were able to call the technology to look at their cell phone. And so Mary's looking at Donna, and Donna's looking at Mary. And I mean, this is live and in color. They're several miles away. They could have done that also if they'd have been, you know, transcontinental or whatever. So technology is there. It's not the same one because it puts a greater burden on us. It's a hardship. It's a challenge. It's a large bump in the road, but we can overcome it. But I look forward to the time when we can all be back together again. And we can sing and shout and praise his name <laughs> and not worry about rules and regulations or some virus. Church is good for you. Um, what I will do is I will, I will make this available to you rather than reading all these things. But just study after study after study. The knowledge is there. The facts are there. So I can tell you that when we believe what the Word of God says, it teaches that church is good for us. And then we read what the scientific community, the medical community in particular aspect of the scientific world, they've done the research and they've determined that uh, regular church attendance is good for you. It's good for your health. We're following that science. I'm going to promote that. Amen? Amen? As a matter of fact, I made a little parenthesis, parenthetical statement when I read to you the statement from New York Times. Because you see, scientific studies shown that a person who regularly attends church can live up to seven years longer than someone else. Adds years to your life. But it does something else. Are you hearing this? Are you writing this down? It adds years to your life, but it also adds life to your years. People are better off. Let me remind you again. This church has been remarkably, incredibly blessed. When you, when you think about, and I just heard this just recently, last year, life expectancy in America, instead of increasing, it declined. Somehow or another, we just lost a little of the ground there. But you see, it's not yet 80. It's still in the upper 70s. Well, hey, I'm already past that. And I'm in pretty good health. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I know the age of a lot of you, and I guarantee you we've got a lot of seasoned saints who are in this room right now, and we've got more who are out there watching this by live stream who are in their 80s and beyond. God has blessed people in this church. Amen? God has blessed people in this church. Church is good for you. And I urge you and encourage you. It'll help your blood pressure. Again, I'm just going to print this out for you. It's just too, too wordy. Come, Sister Rosalind. And, and I want us just to just take a few moments just to do something. There is no place like being in the presence of the people experience the presence of God. So many times over the years I've seen people, I've seen them when they came into the sanctuary and you look at them and they look so downtrodden, so discouraged, just bewildered. But I've seen them as the service progressed as like their countenance gradually changed. And by the time the service was over with, the 
Jonathan said, totally changed. It was obvious that the burden had been lifted. The despair was gone. There was peace. There was joy. It was refreshing. You see, one of the things that we are to do, one of the things we're going to do, and this is so important that we do this in this church, we're to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And we're to sing and make melody in our hearts to the Lord. And the companion verse says, Let the word of Christ drill in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with the grace of thanks in your heart to the Lord. Music. Do for you what nothing else will do, amen. So let's just in the presence of the Lord. Let the Lord, let the presence of God just envelop you and engulf you right now. touch you in a way that you've never been touched before. So that you experience the presence of God like never before. You can do it every day in your devotional time with God if you'll just do what the Bible says. Come before His presence with singing. Enter into His culture with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name. Approach God. Worshipfully. Reverently. With your focus on Him, you're not worrying about what you're going to do tomorrow. You're not worried about how you're going to pay that unpaid bill. You're not worried about the people next door or about your children or your grandchildren or, or your supervisor. You're just thinking about how great God is. How wonderful God is. How worthy He is. You just get absorbed with Him. When you do that, you will experience his presence. And oh, then you don't want to leave. Amen. Father God, Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, your son, I come to you, Lord, on behalf of the members of this body, of this fellowship. Lord, you see exactly what is going on. 
You know, Father, that during this period of time, a number of people in this church body have experienced unbelievable, unbelievable trials and tests and setbacks, crises of so many different kinds of things. Lord, things that they never dreamed that they would have to deal with, but they are having to face those things and fight those battles. But I know your fault, but I know for as you said to the Apostle Paul when he was having the battle that he was with the thorn of the flesh, with the message of Satan sent to buffet him. You said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. Father, I know, I know that your grace is sufficient for your children and all these things. So I pray, Holy Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would just lavish your favor. Lord, just unload an abundance of your favor and your grace upon every member, Lord God, every person that's a part of this fellowship. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen the inner man with might by your spirit. My God, move inly in them in a way, Lord, that they have never known before. I pray that every person, Lord, that is in this sanctuary right now would experience your divine touch everyone in this place would have a divine encounter, Lord. With you right now, dear God, let them know that you're in this place. The minister to them to help them. Lord, obedience to your word, I pray. I pray for them. I am concerned about them, Father, about their well-being, about how things are going with them and for them. And Lord, I just pray that you would bless and meet every need that they have. Lord God, those that are dealing with burdens, cares of this life, my God, my God, I pray that you would help. Those who are watching or have watched this by live stream, those who will view this video later today, Father, minister to them. Lord, I know that there are so many things going on in this church body, this church family right now. Mental, emotional, physical, financial, domestic, job-related, things of all kinds. But Lord, we're leaning on you. We're trusting you. We're looking to you, dear God. And Lord God, we just praise you. We just praise you and honor you for what you're going to do. Can we just take a moment and just praise and honor the Lord God? Lord of my God, a son of a Lord God, in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. We bless you and we honor you, Lord God. We bless you and we honor you, dear Lord. church this evening at 5 o'clock. Remember to pray for one another. Let me thank you again for your faithfulness and giving. And if you have time to offer, you can bring it down here or you can deposit it in a plate that is in the lobby. Again, it is so good to see you. I pray that this message has been very devotional, very focused. And I know that we can be a blessing to one another. 
help one another. So I encourage you to do what I've encouraged you to do in the past, to call people, to say, hello, Lars, just as you're in that moment, let me call you, see, everything's okay. I can pray with you about something. Just, just let the Lord lead you. You may just call somebody just at the right moment because we're all constantly in spiritual warfare. Amen. Let's love one another and let's not be ashamed or afraid to show it. God bless you. Don't forget, next Sunday morning, Brother Butcher will be preaching. Again, I'm having the other half tomorrow. And so following the advice and counsel of the doctors, I'm trying not to preach too soon afterward. Um, and I won't be able to not only look good,